Video production services at HR Tech Tank in New York City, sponsored by Recruitify, a unique new category of recruiting that connects top recruiters with companies looking to hire exceptional talent. Learn more at Recruitify.com. My name is Brendan Sheehan. Uh, I represent a, uh, a fund called GGA Venture Fund. Uh, we were started out of, out of our consulting company, which is Global Governance Advisors, uh, which is a firm that advises boards of directors, uh, works primarily with the Human Resources Committee and the Domination and Governance Committee of large public companies, primarily in North America, but we're increasing uh, our presence in Brazil, Mexico, and Australia as well. So uh, we started the fund uh, three years ago, and we're primarily looking at companies, very early stage companies, uh, often pre-revenue, that align with what we do as a business. So people who are developing technologies or services that help the board and the senior management understand their human capital management, uh, how they're compensated, how they're incentivized, uh, retention is a word that comes up a lot, particularly at the, at the senior levels of uh, executive management, uh, although we do often do engagements through uh, the organization. So we, when we first started investing, we bought companies that could help GGA do what it does and beat our competitors. But then we started realizing as we did that, we were actually developing these companies into things that were a good standalone entities themselves. Uh, we take a very active role. We typically look for a couple of board seats, and uh, m me and my four partners have all run companies, founded companies, failed a couple of times, as most people do, succeeded more often than not. So we like to help to mentor and guide and teach you. We find that people uh, early on are very good at what they're building, but they may not have the marketing or business experience. Uh, and two of the partners are extremely well connected in Canada, so we like to connect people up as well. We can open a lot of doors and, and help to grow. So we're not passive money by any means. Uh, we're currently looking for three or four extra companies in our portfolio. We have uh, three at present, uh, so we would love to to, I've, I've enjoyed some of the presentations today, and if you've got any questions for how we do valuations or ha what strategy we're looking at when we buy in, I'm happy to answer any of those questions as well. Uh, Sasan Galetti from uh, LLR Partners. We're a uh, growth equity, uh, private equity firm based in Philadelphia. Um, a little bit probably later stage uh, investors than you know, the companies that are presented and, and probably the other investors here. Uh, we're typically investing anywhere from kind of 20 to 100 million of equity per deal. Um, we've been around for 15 years and, and kind of all of our investments are either in the technology or tech-enabled services space. Um, a couple of investments that we've had uh, uh, in, in the HCM space specifically. Um, and I, I kind of help uh, um, manage kind of on the, on the software side the investments in the HCM space. So. Um, so it's been great hearing a lot of the, uh, the companies today, and, and hopefully as you guys uh, progress and grow and, and get into uh, later stage rounds, then uh, we hope to, to see you then. Awesome. Uh, I actually have very few questions, because I've uh, been doing that for some time myself. But if you guys have questions, think about them and raise your hands when they're ready. But before we go into that, uh, let me just a bit reflect on my personal experience. Um, what I found in over two, two years uh, in the VC industry is that smart money is a myth. Like it doesn't exist as a fact. And we all have, we, these are very much focused uh, executives. Yeah, <laughs> these are focused executives, so they know the space, uh, and we know the space as well. However, what I discovered is that actual operational involvement and so-called, not operational, strategic involvement and, and smart money can be very destructive for the company. And the only thing that um, uh, an entrepreneur wants from you and that is really helpful is introductions. So the only thing that you can do that is really relevant to the company and can drive actual ROI for your time is introductions. Uh, all the other forms of involvement just didn't work, unless you want to acquire that company eventually. But that's not the case uh, in most um, situations. So my question is, do you believe in smart money? <laughs> I'll try to answer this a little bit differently. Um, you, know, you always hear that it's a bubble when strategics are getting into the VC game. And so I always joke that um, you know, we're, we're not a VC, we're a strategic company, right? Our business is selling software. Um, so we look at the world very differently, th I think, from the rest of these guys in that we don't think about, well, we, we do, but we don't care about valuations. We don't think about returns. Our goal at the end of the day is how can we add value to the business? How, we, how can we add value to the entrepreneurs? 
in our model. So we, we think about it around how can we mentor them into the, building the next stages of SaaS-based businesses, um, uh, how can we expand our ecosystem and bringing them into our clients, um, adding and expanding our ecosystem. So I'm probably not answering your, your question directly, Terrace, but um, the fact of the matter is, is there's lots of money out there and everyone can claim their smart money or not smart money. But um, I, I think as entrepreneurs, you got to think about really what, uh, beyond just the money, what are you looking to accomplish with that investor? Um, what can they help you with in terms of growing the business? Some people don't want strategic investors and that's completely fine. Um, because, you know, some think that you're locked at the hip with that company. Others see tremendous value in adding uh, strategics to, um, to the mix because you get the learning experience, you get the mentorship. Um, you know, part of our theory or investment th uh, thesis is we, we, we've created an accelerator area in, our, in Santa Monica, and that's really to help that mentorship. If you need help with growing in EMEA, we have guys that do it today and, ex and can provide that insight. If you need a developer for a day, hey, go upstairs and we'll find you a developer for the day to help you do something. So our goal is to, to add value a little bit differently than, than these guys that can also add value. Short answer is yes, I do. Uh, I think more people say they're smart money than they really are, and maybe I'm one of those as well. Uh, but to give you an example, one of the, the, the companies we bought last year were, well, company, it was two guys who had built a great piece of code. And I forget who said it earlier on, it was a scraping tool and there's a million of those out there. Uh, theirs was a little bit different. And they were very focused on doing what every other scraping technology was doing, but just doing it slightly differently and making some money out of it. Uh, and what we did is we came in and showed them that they could use that tool in our business, which they would never would have dreamed of in a million years had we not talked to them about it because not very many companies do what we do. There's 37 companies in North America that do what I do, and that's not very many, right? Uh, you go down the road to most consulting firms and there's 37 consultants that do most consulting on Madison Avenue alone. So the smart money can, can often help people who are, particularly in the technology space, very focused on one particular direction and open their eyes to the fact that what they've built can be applied to a lot of different areas and technologies. These guys had built a tool that was scraping compensation data out of regulatory filings, which sounds really boring. It's actually extremely valuable, but we, uh, we, we helped them. I'm, I'm a statistician and, and economist by education uh, and a reformed investment banker. <laughs> Uh, we, we helped them realize that you could actually use that to do what companies really need, which is not know how they pay people, because they all know that already, but how the investors perceive the way the companies pay their people, because that's a window through to the governance of, of, of the organization. So that was smart money that they wouldn't have got elsewhere. So yes, I, I, I do think so. And it's, it comes down to a cultural choice for the entrepreneur. Do you want someone to be actively involved? Do, are you open to the strategic element as well as the, all, the, all the connections and all the, we've got a developer here, we've got a guy in Australia, we've got a guy in Canada, that stuff is great. You, you can also buy that with the money that you get from traditional VC firms, right? You can say, thank you very much, we're gonna go find that ourselves. So that's one element of it. The other part of it is, is, is often seeing, seeing the bigger picture. And I, and I think that's where smart money comes in and it's up to you all to decide if that's what you want. And we have arguments with some of our, our uh, companies that we invest in, which is good because they're convinced that what they're doing is right. Uh, but they may not see that other people are doing that. People can get very caught up in, in, in what they do. I call it founder's syndrome. You know, it's kind of like every parent thinks their kid is brilliant. Well, most of them aren't <laughs> because by definition we can't all be special. Every person who builds a technology thinks their technology is brilliant. And it might be. But there's a million other people doing what you do out there, so that's where smart money can help you. So I think I am in the middle because you know I'm observing at the market that a lot of VCs, especially uh, those who like a background of the partners, is simply from the uh, investment banking. You know, they first really uh, want to help you, but then they have some other projects in the pipeline and. In the end, it's simply financial investment. So, you know, uh, always I recommend to when you go with the VC, it's not only like one-way communication. You have to actually check, you know, the background of those partners and if they really have something to uh, to help you. Yeah? Because int uh, introduction is 
okay, the, the most of the part, it, and uh, it's it really ha uh, can help people. But on the other hand, you see maybe there is entrepreneur. You know what I see in the especially the seed investment for the companies like today by presenting is like a, a lack of. Uh, expertise how to run the business yeah so you know they are like uh, good engineers they are good marketers but they don't know how to be an entrepreneur and that one when you on the side of the vc you have one entrepreneur who already uh, developed the business and sell it it's it's really crucial uh, uh, crucial knowledge to be passed to them and that's the smart money sometimes you bring only the discipline to the people you just you know create this environment of uh, quarterly reports which actually you know like you don't care but you know like actually only discipline to bring it to you to see to get a the feedback then there is this you know environment when you create with them and and I th I think that um, sometimes it's it's very crucial just to bring the discipline to the to the team and let them do what they want because you invest in them at the first place means like they are a good team. On the from the uh, perspective of strategic, it's completely different game. From strategic, your goal is like to just extract the value for your client, and sometimes it means you just you know like. Uh, destroy the company but it's like a, that, that game is like that yeah so you know i would be careful about strategic you know <laughs> especially if they really want to integrate but uh, you know i think there's some sort of math th theorem that would apply here because we for sure know there's um less less intelligent money out there for sure by, so by reciprocal i think there's got to be some smart money out there right <laughs> Uh, but I, I would say um, it, it more in line with what the gentleman down here was talking about. I think, I think it's a matter of match and what you need, your, the chemistry of your team, where your business model is. Um, there's all, you're, you're going through development cycle in terms of what you need and what's important. And a good VC and a good partner and I underline partner should be willing to help you with all those things. Um, if you're, if you're coming to me to run the business, there's trouble. I mean, I don't want to run the business, but we will make introductions. We, I think there is a lot of pattern recognition, for sure. Um, VC, it's, there's no such thing as passive investing in PC. You need to know, have industry focus um, or you get wiped out, for sure. So I think there is a lot of uh, intelligent, uh, smart capital out there, and I'll, I'll hand it over to one of them right now. Yeah, I'll just be quick, because uh, I think everything's mostly been said, but... I, w I mean, I would agree that the, the tactical thing, you don't want to bring on an investor just to do tactical things, to make introductions, to, um, to help you sell. I mean, you could, you, know, you could take the money and you can, buy, you, know, you can buy that expertise. Really what you want is a partner to help you think through strate strategic issues that are really going to define and kind of shape the curve of the company as you guys grow. Um, and, you know, from our perspective at LLR, I mean, over 15 years we've invested in 70 platform businesses. And one thing that we've sort of gotten a sense for internally when we look at the data is that, you know, as companies scale from 20 to 50 to 100 to 150 million of revenue, there are certain inflection points and certain, you know, structural things within a company that, that end up changing management, the way you sell, the way you incentivize your employees. So I, I think it's important, you know, to, to, to have a partner. Uh, I think there are a lot of smart investors that can provide that similar type of skill set, but you know, it's important that, that when you're thinking about bringing on an investor, it's, it, it's really not the tactical things, but it's really, you know, a good partner who understands your business and, and can help you with the strategic uh, decisions. Awesome. So, um, and anybody wants to share from the entrepreneurs the perspective, why do you think smart money actually uh, exists? And wh where do you see investors adding value? So, David, you... Well, I mean, my, my issue, and I'll stand up because I'm behind... Um, I have managed a couple of hedge funds myself, small microcap funds, and my, I have a real question for the strategic side because I've never been involved in that type of relationship um, of really to expand upon how that really works. Um, I do have, our company has a small public company that's actively trying to do a joint venture with us right now, but as far as the smart money goes, I agree tremendously with all of you guys and you know with uh, what you just said. Um, specifically the times that as you're growing, um, and I've seen with the companies that I invested, it's been a significant problem that they don't listen to your experiences with other companies that you've invested in. And you guys have all invested in numerous industries. So the reason why I agree with smart money, obviously, is you've seen companies listen, you've seen companies not listen, you've seen the success, you've seen the failure, 
any entrepreneur that thinks they know it all is probably a stupid investment. So that's my point. But when you get a chance, I'd, I'd like to either privately or in the forum to hear more about the strategic because my concerns with strategic obviously is what he was saying that you're really beholden to your king um, or is it that you are helping lift them up and boosting their revenues to the level, especially a lot of us as entrepreneurs, our companies haven't hit that inflection point revenue wise where we can get the higher view valuations in my space specifically, um, you know, where you're getting the 27 times revenue multiples in a revenue uh, company, in a early stage revenue company. So. Uh, we don't, you know, again, back to my theory, we're not a VC, right? So we don't want to lead a deal because that uh, we're constrained a little bit by, by our company and our board. We can't take a board seat or we don't want to take a board seat. We probably could if we wanted to. Um, but there's really a couple of caveats that we want to have. We basically want to have some sort of observer rights, right? So, so we participate in the building of the company. Um, we don't want to influence a lot of decisions. We want to be helpful. We don't want to mentor. The other kind of key factor for us is we want to have notification rights. So if someone comes to you and says, wow, we really love, you, love you and it's a competitor of ours, we want to be able to know that so we can react accordingly. We try to keep it very simple in our approach. I mean, our goal isn't to destroy companies. We invest into companies. I mean, our theory is we want to invest into companies that we could potentially acquire in the future. Our goal, though, isn't to destroy them so that we can buy them for 10 cents on the dollar. That doesn't make sense for us at all. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know. You, you know the, in the financial remorseful funds um, out in Denver? You know the deal that he did, I think it was with b &A years ago, where they basically guaranteed to fund his fund, and then uh, they had an option to acquire the balance for like $950 million or something? Do you guys structure your deals like that, where you have an option to acquire a much No, we, we don't put any of that in. Ours are very simple. Ours. We, we, Listen, we're a founder-driven company, so our CEO is very much, you know, still has the entrepreneurial bug and wants to build an entrepreneur-friendly model. Um, you know, it varies, though. I mean, so part of, we have three companies. One is an inter internally incubated idea. One is a, um, a seed convertible. And the third is a Series A, um, uh, which we paid a, a premium to because we, we like the business, we like the entrepreneurs. So all kind of three different things of structure. Um, where we see it actually getting messy, and there's a, uh, there's a big thing, I'm sure all of you know who Tinder is, but Tinder was basically incubated by AIC, and that seemed to has gotten very messy, uh, just the way they've structured that business. Now, Tinder is worth, worth a lot of money, but the way it's structured is, is very messy, and that's, that's more of the model I get scared of is if you're incubating an, an idea that puts a lot of control in the founder's hands and or the founders build a very strong business that actually outpaces the core business. Um, but outside of that, you know, we, we try to be very entrepreneurial friendly. I don't know if that answers your, your question or not. Sure. Yeah, to, to that example. No, how it was. So that example, Alibaba and Yahoo, they actually had to sort of spin off that company into a separate company in order to keep that invest, in investment. So uh, my other question, uh, and before I had given a microphone to the audience, is we were talking a lot about point solutions and the different between, difference between platforms and point solutions. Would you, as a fund, invest in a point solution? Why and why not? Yes, he gave it to me because he knows that we are investing in a point solution. Yes. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, refle my reflection is that, you know, uh, that uh, it is something in the middle. Of course, nobody invented it because like, the problem is that you don't want to um, uh, introduce the platform which is really hard to uh, integrate with your solution what you already have. Had so all those sub saba etc. It's 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 really you you are waiting like nine months, and you don't want to do it. But on the other hand, those simply solutions like you know there was this survey that you know like one HR person has like eighteen solutions like that you know eighteen, and yeah eighteen points of login. So on the other hand, it's also very 
uh, very uh, overwhelmed. So, but in the middle, it should be something that uh, integrates the talent system because, you know, that's integrated process like from recruitment, you know, all the HR uh, professionals knows that, you know, when you recruit the guy and you already have some data, you have to use it in onboarding, you have to use it then in development, etc. And today we have, okay, all that uh, integrated platforms which, which are really hard to use and everybody hate it and it's not user centric. Uh, and on the other hand, you have these point solutions that you cannot exchange the data. So, you know, like now the, the, the thing is, and I'm waiting for it, and that's why he gave me the mic, for somebody to build the backbone, which is backbone which you can integrate the, those one point solutions, but the backbone is the process, starting at the recruitment and uh, the ending at uh, retirement. So that, that, that should be like the next solution for HR. You know, there's a lot more point solutions than there are platforms. Um, a lot of platforms need differentiation. Uh, a a well-architected uh, well point solution can fit very nicely in. The caveat here is you can't overspend. You can't overinvest. You have to be realistic what they're going to spend for that. But, uh, you know, it's all about getting that overall fund return. And if you can do, you know, you don't always have to hit the 100 times, you know, your money. You can do very well double and triples and, and, and point solutions um, can contribute to that. Uh, well, this goes back to the smart money question, I guess, and um, my experience with uh, venture capital boards, for instance, is that as an entrepreneur, I, I always love having investors who actually were operators and entrepreneurs themselves. Um, and what I found a lot of times you see in the early days of venture capital in New York in particular was a lot of people came out of banking and went into venture capital, which, you know, makes sense. And they have a great financial sense and a great investment sense, but it's actually hard to relate to them as an entrepreneur because the worlds were so different. And, and maybe you could just address that a little bit in your own experiences where you feel like, are you coming at it as a financial investor or someone that actually has operating or entrepreneurial experience? And, and do you see a difference the way that maybe I've seen that difference in the past? Uh, so I started my career in investment banking, uh, very quickly focused on business and tech services, and I've done that for 20 some years. Took over 26 companies public, work with, uh, I think I have a pretty big network. Um, I, you know, I think it comes down to individual. Um, there's a big part of this game is matching your growth strategy and your capital strategy. And you get one of those off uh, alignment, uh, it doesn't matter almost how well you do. So uh, in terms of dilution, being smart about doing that. Um, understanding, you know, how to set up your exit is a big value add. Uh, and so, you know, I think it just comes across of, you know, individually what the background, what people bring to bear. I, I've heard that critique before. I've met a lot of investment bankers that make horrible investors. I've, I've, I've met a lot that make really good investors. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I think that's a, that's a very valid concern. And uh, I, too, started investment banking and, and left pretty quickly. And I think, um, you know, at least at, at, you know, even at, at sort of the later stage growth equity, and I would say, you know, down to venture, uh, it is very much about strategy. I and mean, we, we spend uh, the, the time up front, obviously, being deal guys and getting the deal done. And you got to think financially about that. But you know, then you're in the investment for the next five to 10 years. And that's really a, a much more strategic hat. Um, and then we, you know, the way we sort of at LLR kind of bridge that um, is we have people who are you know, operating partners that, that work with us that are, you know, who have run Fortune 500 companies or mid-market growth companies and sort of have successful track records. And, and they, they kind of align with the CEOs in our portfolio companies. And, and sometimes they're not even on the board, but they are uh, just in an, another outlet uh, and sort of coach sometimes to the, to the CEOs of the portfolio companies. And that tends to be, you know, I, I think a stronger connection uh, sometimes than, than with, uh, you know, the, the, the folks at the firm. I think that I was just thinking who I am because I, I, I am like, but, but, uh, I hold them actually master degree from HR, but I never use it. <laughs> then I become an entrepreneur, but uh, you know, that was like, I built the company and then after 10 years, I was already, you know, uh, bored with that company because it, it became the corporation. So I sold it and then I become the, uh, because I, I think that, uh, what you need is, is that, uh, that's why I really love your product. <laughs> because sometimes people 
want to be somewhere different where, where they are. So then I went to the University of Chicago and did the financial program, and I, and I become investor. And I think that it really depends on the, on the uh, stage where you are actually helping people. And I think that at early stage, it's more about, uh, about the entrepreneurship because you then somehow can relate to the problems. So you look for more entrepreneur spirit. But on the other hand, the guys from the investment banking, you want, you want to have them in the team because they help you to structure the deal at the exit or at the run B, etc. Because it's like a financial, uh, you know, like a, a lot of financial tools. And they have this um, financial point of view that they, they love your product, but they also love their money that invest into you. So they somehow, it's, they are this, you know, like a break for you to, to just not go to go crazy, you know, with the, with the cost, etc. So I think it's, it's really different again. It diff I think that entrepreneurial spirit in the beginning, but in the end, when you have B, C rounds, it's, it's better to have uh, financial bankers. On. I think you got that the wrong way around. I think they love their money first and then the product afterwards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, it's... It's a very good question, and it is a very fair one as well. I mean, I, I think one of the big problems for entrepreneurs, and I started my life at the age of 19 as a pastry chef and started my own restaurant in Australia, did that for a couple of years, got into capital markets afterwards doing ponds and, and uh, derivatives and all that murky sort of stuff, uh, left and then got into some other startups after that, so I kind of went the other way around instead of going into finance first. Uh, I think one of the, the areas where problems are created most is that, there's a misunderstanding between the, what the shareholder thinks they're getting out of the company and what the entrepreneur thinks they're getting out of it. And you've got to be very careful, we're always very careful about managing that expectation. Is it a fund that's looking to give you capital with an exit strategy to get out in two years? Are they going to put a lot of pressure on you to sell or to increase revenue or increase contracts under uh, under management, whatever it is that you do, uh, or is it an investor that's going to be there to help to nurture you and grow you through? People forget about the, to you it's a human thing, right? To us often it's a financial thing, right? And you can't solve all those problems with mathematical formulas. So I think that's where those pr problems come from, uh, if I'm understanding your question properly. And it's, it's, it's really, I see it all the time. Uh, companies that are forced to go public, they don't want to, but they have to because the VC guys force them to to get the payouts, right? And that's something you need to, established from day one is, is this a business that you're looking to grow, get money, flip it in three years and start another one? Or is it something you want to do for a long time? Because that's when you get conflicts between the shareholders. And that's one of the first questions that I ask anyone that we invest in is like, what do you want my money for? And what do you want us for, right? We had, for example, when we invested in Intello a couple of years back, the first thing, even before like actually agreeing to talk to us, John, the founder, asked us to share like an investor deck that would explain like what are the criteria of a fund, like what are, um, who are the limited partners, how is it structured, what are you looking for? And we were actually willing to do that because that makes sense. And you actually have to collect references on your investors as well because there are very different kinds of money. Uh, and some may be very destructive for your company. So when talking to a fund, you need to understand what is their exit strategy? What is their investment horizon? What do they want to get out of these relationships? Like yeah, <laughs> like yeah. do something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, many. Uh, but also, you know, like that term sheet, it's, it's the way how you can also structure the deal. You know, that's, that's, that is something that you can just put. What is your exit strategy? What do you want really there? And you, that's also back to your questions about the strategic investor. It's up to you. Maybe you would like to like a, a fixed valuation at 10 times a beta and you are fine with that. You know, that's, you can put that everything to your, at not even like a binding, but then when you start to talk about it, then you know what you can expect because it's like it's both it, it it works both ways you know you give the space for investor to actually think about it because sometimes they just want uh, another uh, you know now it's a lot of money on the market and and they just have to do that 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 deal because they like it and sometimes you just force them to think about exit strategy and then you also think about it so that's i think the term sheet is a good tool to actually you know like structure the deal like in in uh, in that sense. I mean, it, particularly in the, in, in the HR and in, in recruiting tech space, for lack of, you know, not the, quite the right word, but the elasticity of the concept 
and the marketplace, HR in particular is exceptionally fickle. And you know, you may have a great idea right from the get-go, but trying to project out three years in HR time, there, there's got to be a dog year element to that one. I, uh, I, yeah, in HR, there, there, there is some. It, it's related to cankles and spanks and things of that nature and kinds of furniture they want to have a seat at the table at. But that, that, that's, that's to, er, the earlier discussions on does, do, do, is it necessary to have experience in the area that you're creating this entity upon? And this is one, one piece, one slice, in which it does pay to have something of a, of, a, of a futuristic eye, you know, past, present, future, or, you know, a, again, a Clint Eastwood approach to things, the good, the bad, the ugly, and, and bring that stuff to the table. Uh, was that a question or a comment? No, I was going to say, I, 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 <laughs> I promise you've known me for a couple of years. It's, it's, I want to think, again, it, it's, I'm the person who gets the calls. You know, this is better than your mother's cheesecake. I go, I don't think so, but I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. I have three questions, okay. but they're, they're related. No, um, <laughs> so <laughs> the first one is um, for evaluations. Um, my partner, John, and I, we've read the David Rose book and the other book, Angel Investing. And, you know, so the, I think, I don't know if I have the right name, but is it the Cayenne, um, the calculator? Um, so question one, uh, is that something that you, you um, believe in to use? Question two, um, you mentioned about it's good if you can create a term sheet where you discuss, I think, the intentions of each side or try to flesh them out um, to get a meeting of the minds. And third, how can um, you know, companies like yours destroy companies like ours? Maybe later. So, valuation, uh, destruction, any answers? Let me get my list of how to kill a company. <laughs> Okay, so valuation is really individual. It's like it, it's actually in the, uh, in the early stage, the valuation has nothing to do with science. I would say it's like, a, um, uh, but you can structure it, yeah, because we are today talking about value of the company within four years. So we have to somehow structure the deal. And what we actually do is like uh, putting probability and then um, make the, I don't know what is the proper English name for it, like a tranche, uh, the tranches. Yeah. tranches, yeah. So, and tranches really depends on the uh, actual revenue that you will bring. So today I can agree on your valuation, but then in the term sheet and the, in, in the agreement, in the contract itself, I am putting those, you know, like uh, milestones of financial, and we said, okay, we agree on a six times a beta, and that company will be worth like that, and then I will take your, um, shares based on the actual performance within four years. So you can actually structure it, not to, today, because today is like a more emotional uh, you know, talk that, okay, I believe that within five years I will have $100 million. No, please. <laughs> so, you know, like there are, you know, usually what you do is you go tranches and then you have based on the performance, so, and then you just go with these probabilities. Exactly, and that's that's the, the I think the the, the, the the most common way. Well, the usual way that VCs sort of try to value the companies is you basically you project the cash flow to a year X, for example, in five years from now, uh, and then you take a certain multiple that is typical for your industry. For HR tech, is probably what the multiple can be like 10, 10x, 10x, something like that, and then you take a certain you take a discount. So you take a risk discount, you take a you know, country discount, something like that. So you discount that, um, the figure that you got to the risks that you have. And then you come up with a certain number. And then you put it into trash, because it's like absolutely not relevant. And then you do that, and that actually works. Because it's, it's all rule of thumb, actually. There are like certain companies with certain traction have certain valuation. That's how it works. And it's just, in Silicon Valley, it's just rule of thumb. They, everybody knows that, and every VC, yeah. So, you know, like rule of thumb is that, you know, it's 30% probability, and then, you know, like, you have this long-term, you know, investment banking stuff, so we had, it is, like, 38% uh, is discount rate for that kind of, uh, yeah. so, and that's it, you just calculate, and then you have a cash flow. So, I was just going to... 
Yeah, I was just going to call bullshit on, on Terrace here because, I mean, if anyone shows you a five-year calculation and you build a valuation off that, you're, you're, not very, you're, you're not smart money. I mean, the fact of the matter is um, valuations are going to be all over the place. And I'll give you a couple of examples, right? We, we invested in a four-month-old company. They got a Series A investor. They raised $8 million bucks uh, on a $28 million valuation. Four-month-old company, no revenue, right? But there's reasons why we invested into them. So, and we were, you know, uh, we have a, a, a different outcome. You know, I, I brought up that company, Zenefits, right? Zenefits last year, Zenefits last year raised, I forget what the amount was, $60 million on a million and a half ARR at a $450 million valuation. Seriously. It was insane. Because what they did is they got every VC in the valley chasing them. They get term sheets from uh, all of the top tiered VCs. So I guess there's a couple of ways you can look at this is you build demand by getting as many term sheets as you can. I'm not necessarily a proponent of that. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy. Um, or you could focus on VCs that you think will add business and you, you care less about the valuation. The fact of the matter at the end of the day is your valuation will be what your valuation should be. Right? You can raise the highest valuation at a Series A, and yeah, it's important to entrepreneurs, but at the end of the day, you will grow into your, your valuation, I think. On the valuation side, I, I wouldn't waste time reading any more books. Uh, there's, a, it, there's at least a dozen ways to value the bonds of publicly listed companies with 100 years of history. Right? You put 12 bonds analysts in a room, and we'll all come up with a different valuation. It, and there's even more ways to value companies that don't have revenue. <laughs> and so you can, you can read all the books you want. And I've read hundreds of them because that's what I did for a living. There's no point, right? Um, what I will tell you is that on every occasion we've ever negotiated with, a, with an early stage company, they always think their company's worth more than it is because they invented it. It's their baby, right? And sometimes you've got to be the one to burst their bubble and say, look, <laughs> this might not be a $100 million company in five years. This might be a $30 million company in five years, but you still do pretty good out of that, right? Uh, how, can, how can all our sorts of companies extract value, not destroy companies? Uh, I, mean, I, I think that's what I was talking about earlier, where you, where you get into misunderstandings about what investors want out of, out of their companies. There are a lot of VC firms out there that will buy in, want to extract the value. I don't necessarily think they deliberately drive your value down to buy it at, at, at 10 cents in the dollar, but I, I've seen it a lot. I mean, Facebook's a great example. They're actually a very successful one. Zuckerberg never wanted to go public. He hated the idea of going public because he's a weird little man who doesn't like dealing with people. <laughs> uh, he is. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But he was forced to go public. There you go. No, I called him that before. It's okay. It's, it, he, he's not going to get upset by that. And if I've got billionaires being mad at me, I don't care. He's, he's got bigger problems. Right? <laughs> uh, it's, it's all about the expectation. I, I, I think, and that's why we're very careful. We don't invest in, in, in companies, in people who are looking to build a technology to sell it and then go on to move the next technology. That's not what we want to do. And then go on to build something new, program something new. That's not what we're, we're, we're interested in. We are much longer term than that. Uh, but that, I mean, everyone's got a different time frame, right? I think it's, and it's, 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 it's like corporate governance. It all comes down to your time frame. Bad governance is actually really good in the short term. <laughs> but it's not very good if you're investing for the longer term because eventually it's going to bite you. Right? Whereas good governance longer term will have slower profits but, but more secure ones. It's all about timing. Uh, and, I, and I think there's a, there's a mismatch between what investors, VC, private equity, whatever you want to call them, want out of a company and what you guys want out of it. Always do the math. So there's, there's always do the waterfall in terms of how many dollars you're going to get if the company is eventually sold for whatever, pick a number. Because, you know, the headline number, you can always come up with whatever the headline number is that, that the valuation is. But beyond that, there's structure and there's governance and there are other things. So, you know, common stock is very different than preferred, which is very different than participating preferred with a dividend. And so, you know, all of that eats into, you know, whatever, whatever returns you as a founder is going to get at the end of the day. So, so I'd say that's a simple exercise just to figure out at the end of the day, what am I going to get? Um, and then the second, the third question was, how do we destroy value? Is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it goes back to I think the, the points that we hit on, which is make sure you you have a partner, a real partner in the business. Uh, if you're, you know, I think if it is a you know financially oriented investor that's only con concerned about the numbers, I think you know that, and, and you're not as a result, you're not making the long-term investments, which is the whole 
you know, reason to be a private company, right? Is that so you can make those, you can be unprofitable in the short term uh, so that you can be profitable in the long term, right? So you want an investor that's really aligned with you on those goals and, and you're kind of rowing in, in the same direction. Just real quick, I, I would agree 100% um, in terms of the waterfall. And the, the times when I've seen things get challenged is when you do have different classes of securities, different investors with different um, time points, and literally different incentives. Um, so you know, the general rule of thumb, you know, you've got to do multiple rounds of financing, generally speaking, but keep it simple. Uh, everyone focuses on the valuation. The terms are, are nine times out of ten just as important. Hire a good lawyer. Uh, we, we've been talking about the finance side of it. Uh, be careful about how new stock can be issued and whether you can get diluted out as, a, as an owner. Uh, we see that happen a lot. People who buy in in the early rounds will get diluted earlier on. So that's why we like to have some control over how new, new, new stock gets, get, gets put out there. So that's something that, that uh, yeah, we're talking about the math and the finance side of it, but a, a good finance lawyer who, who can advise you on, on where the future might be in, in terms of what happens if you for each new round of capital is very important as well. Yeah. And, and it's one thing, when you are really early stage, think about convertible notes, and that's the simplest, you know, like then you have no problem. Go with the simplest, that's the right approach. There are like templates for convertible notes on some of the uh, websites of incubators and funds. They are usually like maximum straightforward. So very simple, classic terms. If you are not going to screw your investors, you would probably go for those, like as simple as possible. So, so we're all talking about HR technology, and so I'm curious as, as investors, do you look at how mature the startup is in data integration? There are dozens of systems that almost any one of these technologies is going to have to integrate with potentially. Do you look at their, their ability to, to integrate with other systems or think about that kind of scope? I mean, I know that we get that all the time, but there almost isn't an HR tech out there that's not going to have to connect to something else. So is that part of your consideration plan? Part of the answer is yes. So part of our model is, is that we are opening up what we do as a technology provider, opening up our ecosystem, opening up our APIs. Part of our investment thesis is we want to invest in the SaaS-based businesses that have a similar concept, right? So we can integrate using more modern standards, open APIs versus, you know, the five or ten year ago um, ways to integrate. So it, it's definitely important for us tied to what our objective is, is to build out our ecosystem. So yeah, we look at the technology. I'm of the opinion though, if you're starting a company today, you're building it to modern based standards, right? Which is REST-based APIs. That to me is a must have if you're starting a company today. Um, you know, other types of, of things, you're building mobile first, right? So um, that maybe is more of an expectation of me, but I definitely think it's important for sure. Yeah, um, I'm in that space like 15 years and, uh, you know, what I realized in the beginning that was uh, historically HR was this cat, cat ladies or they called it Marsha, you know, so Marsha, Marsha. That was like charm, uh, like, uh, you know that. So, so Marsha didn't have any uh, thing with analytics, you know, but what we, what we can see now it's uh, because I think that's because of that we have... Uh, actually like come to the point where they started to see that everything there is broken. I mean, not only recruitment, talent, everything is broken. And uh, each company claims that the, the, the most important uh, resource is human capital, which is totally, I don't want to <laughs> swear here, but, uh, but yeah. But the thing is that, uh, you know, like the, the, the uh, talent uh, life cycle, it's integrated process. And you have to have data to actually, you know, like uh, follow that process. It's the same as product, you know, in the product, in the stupid Pepsi Cola, whatever, you have like how you produce it. Then you have cost per uh, what, uh, the, the drop, and then you have cost per, uh, uh, per whatever you do it from. And then you have everything. So you, you ha we have like a data for our products and we don't have a data about, about the people. And of course, that is really hard to measure the people because you know, that, that's the problem that, you know, 
we cannot measure the people. We don't even know how to do it. But there are some scientific solutions already to actually, it, it's not important how you measure the people. You can be face at five, you can be whatever disk, etc. It still gives you more information at, uh, about, the, about the probability that that guy will do good or bad. So yes, I believe in HR analytics and I believe that we are in this pre-HR analytics model. What Michael actually said, I was, I was reading that Bersin um, prediction 2015. So it's like only 4% four, four of the companies that actually use predictive analytics. Everybody thinks that when they collect data in Excel, that's the uh, big data or whatever. So, but yes, that's the future and I think that we should invest in th that kind of uh, solutions that help and can be integrated with each other and with everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the short answer, like all good short answers, is it depends. Uh, one of the things that I like to look at is the maturity of who you're selling it into. Right? Uh, a lot of HR technologies are aiming directly to sell to the HR officer or the HR department. I'm seeing, and what, what, what we do in our line of work, uh, I'm, I'm seeing increasing demand for uses of this sort of information, uses of this sort of analytics in the compliance department. And if you're selling to the compliance department, integration is not as important because they have very few tools that they use right now. If you're selling to the board of directors, we've actually sold some of the, the uh, technology that we have and the, the data that we collect directly to the board of directors. They're not integrating with anything, so it doesn't matter. So it, it, we, we, we do like to know that they've considered it, particularly if they're selling directly to the HR space, but you need to think about the maturity of the market that, that you're actually trying to sell to. If it's the CCO or the or the board, it's not as important. Actually, one of the like top three things that we are looking at, because the only like way out of being a point solution is being able to integrate with absolutely anything and being so small and flexible that you are able to plug in in any other system or to to provide your API to any other system, so you can work jointly with that. Yeah. that. So, I mean, you know, when we started building our company about a year ago. Um, one of the biggest challenges we had was HRSs are not open, right? ADP is not open. Right? Sure. Uh, Cornerstone is just starting to get into, get into that. So as much as we can be open, we built it wide open, mm -hmm. right? But who can we integrate with? Right? Yammer, you sure. know, Microsoft, you know, uh, SharePoint, maybe a little bit. But interesting enough, the place where ADP announced they now have an app marketplace. Yeah. That's huge. I mean, for a company like me, that's huge. It suddenly adds a tremendous amount of value to your, to your, to your point solution where somebody may have said, we'd love to use you, but if you can't extract data from ADP about starts and finishes and single sign and all that, forget it. And then, you know, having a conversation two weeks ago, finding out ADP has a marketplace. That's huge. It changes everything from an integration standpoint. It changes, I think, the whole point of the solution. Well, it's also about data velocity, too, right? So HR data is intrinsically slow. Person, right? But who's right. right. hired and who's leaving, which is really what you're talking about to a certain extent early on integration, is just as simple as that, right? We get that information back. Yeah, that's, 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 those are daily triggers. They're not every 15 seconds. But, I get that. I get that. But we said, but that, if you can start with yeah. like, which is basically what you will have right now, yeah. you can then build on it. At least you have something. You yeah. can't get a no, I'm not going to use that. We do daily, and it's plenty fast for everybody. I mean, but. No one's doing EDI stuff anymore with 15 second delays in HR, you don't need it. Yeah, yeah. But take, take, like, take an example of job rate. They don't, don't even have a UI, UX. It's just, it, it's just API that you can plug in in any other system. And that makes you absolutely flexible. So what is the most annoying thing about an entrepreneur? Who wants to take this one? I think just the worst thing that an entrepreneur can do is not know his market. Uh, and part of not knowing your market is saying it's going to be a $200 billion market or um, not knowing who their competitors are or um, just being very naive. I think that's, that to me is, is mistake number one. If you don't or can't describe what your market opportunity is, um, you know, I think you're dead in the water. Uh, I'll probably think of some others as well. But. Yeah, that's probably the most common. Um, a little bit of this happened, ha happened today. One of the things that I find very annoying is that you'll get people who are very enamored with what they've built, because what they've built is great, but they'll get through 30, 35 minutes of talking without telling me what problem they're solving. You know, Start with that. I'm a former journalist. Don't bury your lead. Put it right up front. Say, this is what I'm solving, and this is why it's important, and then tell me how you do it. Don't give me half an hour of how you do it, and then tell me what you're solving. Right? That, that kind of annoys me, along with not knowing who your competitors are, not having a good idea of, of where you fit among that market space. 
Yeah, I, of course, agree with you um, both. Um, for me, also, uh, a very big mistake is that, okay, I have like 15 minutes speech, and then in the end, I don't know how much do they want and for what, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That's like, yeah, okay, or, or we are not raising, which is catchy, but please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had all, all good comments. I've lived through all those as well. Um, I'd say um, just also not being able to calculate an ROI. So what's the value and what's the return? Why would a smart client want to buy your service? What's the payback? I mean, th I, I, I had the opportunity last year to present to 50 of the top, I think it was 200 CFOs in the country. And if you, if you have an HR solution and you can't prove your ROI, you're, you're out of luck. I mean, so knowing your ROI is pretty important. Today I was meeting an entrepreneur and he was saying, he was saying like, well, uh, HR professionals love our ROI. And I was saying, okay, fair. What is your ROI? So he, he's saying like, our ROI is how we calculate it. On every dollar of investment into our product, uh, HR professionals get $4. And now he stops. <laughs> and then he switched the topic, like Siri literally switched the topic and not talking about that anymore. So like, okay, you should be able to talk, to talk about your ROI and how exactly are you calculating that and how do, how do you derive, where do you derive that figure from? Because it's very hard to calculate an ROI from, for a product, especially in HR. So being able to at least know the components of your ROI is quite helpful. Yeah, and uh, one other piece I'd add to, I think these are all great comments, and then the other thing I'd add is you can really tell quickly if, if uh, a you know, CEO or founder has their pulse on the business and if they've got you know, the three or four KPIs that they you know, religiously track and, and kind of you know, know very well, that, that really will be the levers that drive the business, so knowing that. I always ask, like, what are the key, three key metrics that you are monitoring and that you care about and that you are looking at every day? Uh, guys, I think if anybody, like, wants to say something, I hope not, because as I said, <laughs> <laughs> that's an unconference, but, you know, know your limit. So, yeah, thank you very much. Are you telling that me? Okay, I'm the boss here. So, thank, guys, thank you very much. Actually, I want to say thank you to Aki because that last question, I loved it. And you can like write, write a separ separate article on it, like the most f annoying thing that an engineer can do. So, and I actually wrote all that stuff, so I probably will. Yeah, and, and, and the mo that's a good one. The most, next time we're going to have an entrepreneur panel and ask what is the most annoying thing an investor can do? And for sure we'll get some interesting answers. So thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Video production services at HR Tech Tank in New York City, sponsored by Recruitify, a unique new category of recruiting that connects top recruiters with companies looking to hire exceptional talent. Learn more at Recruitify.com.